Good morning. We welcome all who are gathered here and all who are worshiping with us online this day. Uh, we're glad that you're here to celebrate this day that the Lord has made with us. Um, a couple of announcements I want to call your attention to. Uh, some things that are happening this week. Tonight we are going to have our first youth group Zoom meeting in a while. That will be at 5 p.m. An invitation will be going out to all of our uh, youth group members. That's our 6th through 12th graders. We hope that you'll join us for a time of just saying hello, seeing what's going on in your lives as we move ahead. Uh, the Wednesday morning Bible study is on Facebook Live at 10.30 a.m. and We are going through the 23rd Psalm, so we invite you to join with us on that. And finally, a THWAG will resume. That's for our kids in kindergarten through fifth grade on Thursday at 5 o'clock. Once again, that is Zoom. Uh, so we'll get an invitation out for that gathering as well. A reminder to all that this upcoming Saturday, January 16th, we will be having a memorial service for uh, Mary and Terry Harris at 1 p.m. Uh, we encourage people to uh, worship and celebrate Terry's life online. That broad will be broadcast live on Saturday at 1 p.m. as well. Those of you that do come here, uh, to remember Terry, we will have social distancing and mask requirement for the gathered body that day. The session will be meeting in upcoming weeks as we move forward. And uh, uh, finally, um, as most pastors are asked to do, is to speak to our situation in our nation. Um, I Believe me, I do not have all the answers and I want to make sure everybody knows that. I did put a post yesterday on Facebook. I do that every Saturday. I encourage you to take a look at the post I put on Facebook yesterday because I truly did address the situation in our nation. But I also want to read this statement uh, for all of you who are worshiping with us in person or online this day about the situation in our nation. Um, and I'm going to start off with actually some words that my cousin, uh, who was a retired pastor, wrote. We must all start to listen to one another and respect the opinions of those who disagree with us. They are not the enemy. As long as we are committed to the truth and the rule of law and respect for each other, we can heal. We can continue to debate the best way to govern and thus preserve our democracy. If you won the election, don't gloat. Reach out to the other side and find ways to work together. If you lost, get over it. If each of us in our own way can overcome the anger and ugly spiritedness, we can find our way to a brighter future. I believe in the American people enough to believe that we can do that. And I'm going to re-quote from him another statement, but these are my words now too. And uh, this is one of the things as the pastor here at Summit Presbyterian Church, I want to make a promise to all of you. I promise that I am going to do my best to love you. I'm going to love you whether you're a Democrat or a Republican. I'm going to love you whether you're conservative or liberal. I'm going to love you no matter who you voted for in the last election. I'm going to love you whether you agree or disagree with me. And I will fail because I'm not a perfect human being just like the rest of us. But that's my word to you, that I'm going to do the best to do that for everybody, everybody that's a part of this church family and everybody I encounter. And I hope uh, we'll try to do that as well in all of our lives together. Now I'm going to quote again from what my cousin said at the end. I'm not sure what politicians mean when they say, God bless America. But when I say it, it is a fervent prayer that God will indeed bless us with a better future. So I ask you to pray it with me and believe that it will happen. When we say God bless America, let us really mean it from our hearts. Because we human beings, just like I, with my love to all of you, I'm going to fail. But God, God doesn't fail us. So let's move forward. Let's do our best to love one another. Let us worship God. And I'm calling upon uh, Tom Davey, who's our 
leading us in music today to bring us our intro. Why? invite you to join with me in the responsive call to worship that is on the screen. Let us call upon the Lord this day from Psalm 108. God, my heart is steady. I will sing and praise you with all my being. Wake up, harp and lyre. I will wake up the dawn. Lord, I will praise you among the nations. I will sing songs of praise about you to all the nations. God, you are supreme above the skies. Let your glory be over all the earth. Answer us and save us by your power. So the people you love will be rescued. Help us fight the enemy. Human help is useless. But we can win with God's God's help. He will defeat our enemies. Open up our hearts to your presence, gracious God as we worship you in spirit and truth. Our opening hymn is Savior Like a Shepherd Lead Us.
especially in these times we know that we are not the people that we should be. We have hurt. We have accepted injustice. We have not moved forward as God desires us to move forward. We need to give our sin over to the Lord. With this in mind, I invite you to unite your voice with mine in the prayer confession that is on the screen, and that will be followed by a time for silent confession. Let us pray. Father, we come before you with questions, fears, and wonder about all that is before us. We question who we are and what we have done. Our fear is that we will fail you in some way. We wonder if we can do better as your children, and we wonder if you understand us. Lord, help us to rid ourselves of the things that hold us back. Help us to move ahead in a way that is pleasing to you. Assure us of the forgiveness that only you can give, and instill wisdom in us that we would dedicate our very lives to serving and loving you. Also, tell us often that you understand us. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hear us now as we silently confess our sins to you, Lord. Hear the good news. Jesus Christ has overcome sin and death for those who believe. Our sins once controlled us and led to death. But now we know that death loses. And sins are forgiven. We celebrate forgiveness with our risen Lord. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Amen. Okay, and now we're on the children's message without... The uh, virtual mystery box. I am thinking of uh, instilling that, but boys and girls, what I need you to do is get two people to come with you if you're watching the service today, because I want to ask questions. And uh, the children's sermon is who knows your best. Maybe it's your mom and your dad. Maybe it's grandparents. Maybe it's two people that are there with you. If you don't have two people, uh, I'll just have you pretend that somebody else is there. But Here's a question. I want you to ask those two people, and only you boys and girls, only you know the answer to this. Okay, the first question you're asking, don't tell them, but I want you to think about what your favorite food is. Now I want those, either mom and dad or whoever, to guess and see if they get it right. See who knows you best. I'm giving a few seconds, though I'm really doing this off the cuff because I have no idea what they're saying to you, okay? Second question for them, for the two people that are there. What is your favorite color? Once again, you don't tell them. Let them answer and guess. See if they both say the same thing. Third thing, what is your favorite subject in school? Okay, let them guess that. Okay, this is a fourth and the final question, and we're going to see... Who knows you best? Okay? The last question that you want to ask is who loves you more, your mom or your dad? Make sure you ask them that question and see what they say. <laughs> okay. Just stir in the pot. You like to stir the pot. Yeah, I do. Especially since I don't have them here. <laughs> okay, boys and girls. Well, that was all. You know, you may sit there and think, who knows you best? Does your mom or your dad know you best? I always felt like when I was growing up, when I was a little kid, that my mom knew me a little bit better. Maybe that was because I spent more time with her. And my back in my day when I was a little kid, my mom was at home, my dad was at work, and that's just the way it was. But I, I, even though, even if my dad had been home, though, knowing my dad, I think my mom just knew a little bit more about me. But here's the important thing, boys and girls, that I want you to remember, and all of you boys and girls of all ages out there, is the one that really, really knows us best is God. God knows all about us. I'll be mentioning today in the sermon that it's God who really made us. We need to never ever forget that. So if anybody knows all about us, it's God. Now people here, you're different teachers. One teacher may know you a little bit better than another teacher. 
One parent might know you a little bit better than another parent. One grandparent might know you better than another grandparent. One coach in a sport might know you a little bit better than one of your teammates. One friend might know you better than another friend. But don't ever forget, the one that knows us best and knows all about us is our Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's have a prayer. And I invite you to pray after me. Dear God, Dear God. thank you for knowing us. Thank you for calling us your children. Thank you for calling us your children. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for loving us. Help us to remember. Help us to remember that you never leave us. That you never leave us. You walk with us every day. You walk with us every day. And your arms are wrapped around us. And your arms are wrapped around us. In Jesus name. Let's have a prayer before we hear God's word this day. Let us pray. Lord, open the ears of our hearts once again to hear you speak. We need to hear your voice in these days more than ever. For it is your voice that brings peace, that brings healing, and that brings answers. So speak to us in Jesus' name. Our first scripture reading from Isaiah 53 will be brought to us by our lay reader, uh, Betty Miller. Betty serves on the uh, session. She is the outreach elder. Good morning. My name is Betty Miller, and I am the elder for outreach. Today's scripture lesson is from Isaiah 53, 1 through 5. Who would have believed what we have heard? Who saw the Lord's power in this? He grew up like a small plant before the Lord, like a root growing in a dry land. He had no special beauty or form to make us notice him. There was nothing in his appearance to make us desire him. He was hated and rejected by people. He had much pain and suffering. People would not even look at him. He was hated, and we didn't even notice him. But he took our suffering on him and felt our pain for us. We saw his suffering and thought God was punishing him. But he was wounded for the wrong we did. He was crushed for the evil we did. The punishment which made us well was given to him. And we are healed because of his wounds. Now we will have our anthem.
I don't know if that was purposeful or if he just did that. Our uh, New Testament reading is two verses from the letter to the Hebrews. I'll be reading from the second chapter, verses 17 and 18. Listen now as God continues to speak to us. For this reason, he, that's Jesus, had to be made like his brothers in every way in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people because he himself suffered when he was tempted. He is able to help those who are being tempted. May God bless to us the reading of his holy word. and May it be a light to us this day. So, just who is Dan Rock? I'm going to tell you who I am, folks, today. I was born June 1st, 1957, to Joseph Patrick and Mary Elizabeth Sweeney Rock. I make note, too, please, that my parents were Mary and Joseph. I'm not saying anything, but I just wanted to bring that out there. <laughs> Bohemian and Irish blood flow through these veins of mine. My favorite color is green. I don't like coconut or peppers of any kind. My favorite sport is baseball. And being a Pittsburgh fan, I haven't had much to cheer about recently, folks. I enjoy movies, and I like to read John Grisham novels. I graduated from Hampton High School, went to Edinburgh State college before it became a university, transferred and graduated from the University of Pittsburgh with a major in psychology, and received my Master of Divinity degree from Pittsburgh Theological Seminary. I'm married to Jan. I have three adult children, DJ, Ashley, and Brittany. I am not handy around the house or around the church. I am not talented musically, and you may not know this, and it may startle some of you, but I've been losing my hair since I was in my mid-twenties, folks. I know that really astounds a lot of you. I have no sisters, and I have three brothers. Dale, who's a retired elementary school counselor. My brother David, who's a retired school superintendent and my brother, Jesus Christ, a teacher. Hey, wait a minute. The Bible passage says that he's your brother, too. That means we're related. Oh, well, you can pick your friends, but you can't pick your relatives, huh? Last week, we talked about Jesus' question to all of us. Who do you say that I am? And this morning, we begin the second part of that journey, where Jesus gives definitions to who we are. The question for each of us today is, who am I? What makes us who we are as individuals? Our human potential as God created it is staggering. Nothing has been left outside of the control uh, or subjection of humanity. The primal statement that begins with Genesis 1.26 where God says, let us make human beings in our own image. Think of the power of those words. You and I, we've been made in God's image. Now sometimes we feel like nobody, yet God is mindful of us and God cares for us. All things are created by him and for him, the Bible says. Each of us has a holy design a magnificent purpose, a kingdom goal. No one else can take our place, and without us, the kingdom of God is less than complete. We must realize how important we are to God and grasp the importance of our relationship to God's Son, our Savior, Jesus. But Jesus did something much greater for each of us, for every one of us for everybody. And Jesus knows us so well, all that we go through, all of our pain, 
all of our struggles, all of our skeletons in our closets, everything about us, specifically because he knows all about us, is why Jesus, why God became one of us. And why, like verse 18 says, he knows our sufferings. He knows our temptations. In other words, he knows things that we don't want others to know. You know, most families keep their family secrets a secret. We don't mention the swindling uncle, or the street-walking aunt. Those stories are kept quiet at the family reunions and not recorded in the family Bible. That is, unless you are the God-man, unless you're Jesus. You see, Jesus displays the bad apples of his family tree in the first chapter of Matthew. That's that list of genealogies. And when you look through that, Jesus, you could say, hails from what we might call the tilted halo society. Doesn't have that halo on straight all the time. I mean, when you look at that list in the genealogies, there's Rahab who was a Jericho harlot. Jacob was a slippery enough that he should have had an electric ankle bracelet on his leg. David was almost seemed to be a schizophrenic. One day composing a psalm, the next day seduced, seducing his neighbor's wife. But Jesus, Jesus didn't erase their names from his list. Not at all. So why did Jesus hang his dirty laundry on the neighborhood clothesline because our family has the sum of that too, don't we? My grandfather, my mom's father, was an alcoholic and he was abusive when my mom was growing up. Um, they got a divorce, my grandmother and grandfather, when it was really extraordinary to get a divorce because of the situation. And my mom spent some time in foster care because her mom could not handle the whole situation herself. That's one of those skeletons in my closet, I guess you could say. And, and my mom, she said that we just needed to move on and get over it at some point. We all have our own stories of our past. Our families all have bruised fruit. And Jesus wants us to know he has been there. Think about Jesus, if you will, for a moment. Look at his hometown. He was raised in this sleepy, humble, forgotten hamlet, a hick town. One that made people say, does anything good come out of Nazareth? You know, as we read through the scriptures, Jesus' earthly father, Joseph, seems to disappear. We don't hear much about Joseph in the Bible other than the birth stories and the one time when he was at the temple. Of course, we assume that he was there teaching Jesus about carpentry as he grew, grew up because that's what Jesus did. So when you seek Jesus, you're almost looking for a single mom. Mary raised him most of the time. You're looking for calloused and dirty hands of a carpenter. And you're looking for common, everyday, ordinary looks. As the Isaiah reading said, No stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. Or as the message translates it, there was nothing attractive about him, nothing to cause us to take a second look. You see, you and I, we identify with Jesus. Our looks are run of the mill. Our ways are simple for the most part, and so are his. He has been there. No matter where you are, Jesus understands. Jesus knows where we've been. He knows our poverty. He knows our social problems. He knows what we've been taken advantage of. Jesus knows. He's been there. He understands us. But even if you haven't been in obscurity, Jesus knows you. Jesus knows when you have a business to run. Jesus knows when you have crowds to manage. Jesus knows when you have a classroom to lead. He understands the stress of leadership, too. Look at, what, look at who he called to follow him as his disciples. One he called was a zealot. A zealot was a person who hated the Romans. 
And then he also called a tax collector who worked for the Romans. He had a demanding mother who insisted that he change the water into wine at the wedding. He needed to get away from his disciples at times. I don't know if they were just overwhelming to him, but he said, I need to get off by myself and be alone with my heavenly father. He had family tension. When he went back to his hometown, they wanted to throw him off of a cliff one time. He was falsely accused. He had his closest friends let him down. Whenever he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, they all fell asleep while he prayed. And he was even unsure about the future. Dear Lord, take this cup from me, but not my will. Your will be done. So why? Why was Jesus like that? Because he knew that you would face the unknown, so he chose to face the same. Whatever you're going through, Jesus has been there. He has experienced all the pain and suffering. He has experienced all the testing and all the temptation. I mean, think about Jesus. Jesus was angry enough to turn over the tables in the temple. He was hungry enough to eat raw grain as he walked through the fields with his disciples. He was upset enough to weep in public when a friend died. He was fun-loving enough to be called a drunkard and a wino. He was joyful enough to attract children to his side. He was weary enough to sleep on a boat in the midst of a storm. He was poor enough to sleep on the ground. He was radical enough to get kicked out of town. He was responsible enough to care for his mother. He was tempted enough to know the smell of Satan. And he was fearful enough to sweat blood as he prayed on his last days. Whatever you are facing, Jesus knows how you feel. Are you feeling frustrated about COVID? About politics? About not being together? About the future? I believe with all of my heart that Jesus knows. When you turn to him for help, he runs to help you. Because he's been there. He knows how you feel. He's not ashamed of you. He's not confused by you. Your actions don't bewilder him. Your tilted halo doesn't trouble Jesus. The season we just finished celebrating is amazing. I mean, there was God, secure in his heavenly sanctuary with massive resources. What did he know about our human struggles? What did he know about living down here in the stench of human decay? With all that power and glory, what did God know about the idea of powerlessness and helplessness in our human condition? But then came Christmas, incarnation, Emmanuel, God with us, flesh and blood walking this earth. So now, whenever we ask, God, do you know? He responds, yes, my child, I know. Jesus knows everything, everybody. We need to remember that as we are going through all that we're going through right now, friends. He will lead us back together. He will get us through the times of suffering and the times of temptation. Each one of us, everybody, is important to him. He knows us better than anyone else. So go to him, no matter what you're facing, my friends. I mean, after all, we are a part of the family. Our sermon response, our statement of faith is on the screen. It's taken from a Hebrews a little bit before the readings that I read today. Let us say these words together. God is the one who made all things, and all things are for his glory. He wanted to have many children share his glory, so he made the one who leads people to salvation perfect through suffering. Jesus, who makes people holy, and those who are made holy are from the same family. 
So he is not ashamed to call them his brothers and sisters. Amen. Our response to him is he is able. stewardship statement and I want to remind everyone uh, we continue to truly appreciate all the support that is coming into Summit Church whether it's online through the offering baskets through the mail we truly appreciate all of that and as today we come to the last part of our mission statement in forward and faith a new beginning we go to the last one which is go serve in our mission statement that's a go serve for our Lord and the world he loves so much. Share faith, help others, work diligently, and shine out God's love in everything you do. Sacrificially serve. One of the ways that we continue to serve is primarily through our mission causes. And one of the big ones that's coming up actually this Saturday is our community meal. When we talk about the elevator, that is going to be a help over there as we go out. The last three statements have been come, come home, come celebrate, come grow. But from that, we grow to this go serve. When we prepare meals and take them out to the hungry in our community, when we give support to mission causes near and far, we are truly sharing the love of Jesus Christ. And who knows who might come into our midst? Who knows who might join us in our ministry of sharing the love of Jesus? wherever we go. Who knows how we might go and make disciples of all peoples. That's the call of Jesus. Now how does an elevator tie in with that? Well, think about it. Just getting people up and down to serve that community meal. Just getting people that may come from that community meal that may not be able to get out that might come to a worship service here. We truly are serving in that way. We are going to be dedicating the elevator on the 24th of this month. Uh, Larry Nelson, who's been kind of our contact person, was at the early service this morning. And uh, he told me, and he wasn't making any promises, but hopefully by the 22nd there is a chance, there is a chance that we might have that completed, to actually be able to use it. But I told Larry, it doesn't matter, we're dedicating it on the 24th no matter what. When people come back, we will have that available to us. So, as we've been doing, there's a little card if you want to pick one up, if you want to send your comments in, in an email or online. Now think about what Go Serve means for us as a church family. How can we reach out to the world around us and the community around us as we serve our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Your thoughts are truly greatly appreciated. Thank you for your continued support. Let us move forward knowing that God, through Jesus Christ, truly is able to get us where we need to be. This time, uh, we are coming to our time of prayer. Of course, we want to pray for our nation and all that has been going on here over the past week, uh, seeing the, the evil and always remembering that good always, always overcomes evil when God is involved. Let us make that our prayer. Uh, for the church family, we have several prayer concerns. Uh, Jane Connor had surgery this past Monday. 
and that went very well. The surgery went well. She was an outpatient. She came home Monday night. But she still has a ways to go for her healing to take place. So she asked for continued prayers. Uh, we also want to pray for Jane's son, Doug Henderson, who continues to have some pain from the wounds in his um, feet and ankles and legs. Uh, pray for Doug as well. Linda Sylvester had surgery this past Tuesday at Fairfax Hospital. She had back surgery. That surgery also went well. She was in the hospital for about three days. She came home Friday um, evening, and she will be recuperating at home, and I believe a therapist is coming in to help her with the healing process. Please continue to pray for Linda. Andy and Eva Worley had asked for prayers for their oldest daughter, Jenny, who tested positive for COVID. Her symptoms have been basically the loss of taste and smell and fatigue. And also, the Gerke and Jeffrey's family have asked for prayers for um, the Gerke's granddaughter, Emily, who's 17 years old and also tested positive uh, for COVID. Emily lives with the Gerkes in their basement. She works at Target. She has very, very mild symptoms right now, but continued prayers for her healing as well. Um, and also Pam Yandel had asked for prayers for the recent passing away of Tim, Tim's mom, Bobby Yandel. Uh, prayers for that family and their grief. Other prayer concerns from the gathered body here this morning, or if I get them from online, just let me know. Yeah, Joan. You lost it. Was it a cousin or an aunt? An aunt. Our prayers are with you too, Joe, on that loss. I, um, Ken Clairbot was at the early service as well, and we had been praying for Ken's brother who had some heart surgery. All went well with that, and he's recuperating too. I forgot to announce that. Other prayer concerns? Any over here, gentlemen? Okay. God knows every prayer upon our hearts and our minds. Let us turn to God in confidence. Let us pray. Lord, um, to start with, we, we put our nation in your hands. We truly do pray, God bless America, because we know that we human beings could never do it. We, we fail, we make mistakes, we sin. So we need your help. May we open our hearts so that you can guide us and direct us and that we can move forward, especially for those of us who follow you, for we are brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. Lord, be with uh, Jane and Linda and uh, Ken's brother as they continue to heal. We pray that your touch would be upon the Worley's oldest daughter, Jenny, upon Emily Jeffrey, upon all of Joan's Alabama family who have tested positive for COVID. Watch over, protect guard and guide them, Lord. We pray for the Yandel family and for Joan all day and for all who have lost loved ones. Remind them that you take that grief upon yourself, Lord. Be with all of us in any way that we are hurting, Lord. Heavenly Father, you know each of us better than we know ourselves. We think we know ourselves. We think we know you, God, but in reality, you are beyond our human understanding. As the scriptures say, we could no more understand you than we could count all the stars in the sky or all the grains of sand on the shore. But you know all about us. The scriptures say that you put us together in our mother's womb, that you know every hair on our heads, that even before we were formed, you knew us and you know our names. In our own weakness of understanding things, remind us often that you know everything about us, Lord. Savior, you know the choices we make every day. Jesus, you know whether we will choose to love or hate, to help or hinder, to be kind or to be hurtful, to be gracious or to be boastful, to look at others above self or to be self-seeking. 
You know if we will choose to follow you or follow the world. In the painful times we are going through as a world, a nation, and as your people, help us to make choices that are pleasing to you, Lord. When we don't, help us to remember that you forgive us and give us new chances every day. Spirit of the living God, you know our hearts because that is where you abide. We truly are never alone. Holy Spirit, guide us in your direction. Lead us to green pastures where we encounter you and your love. Protect us from all that interferes in our life walk with you. Make us the body of Christ, your church. When we encounter doubt, fear, anger, disappointment, worry, or whatever would cause us to forget, open our hearts once again, for we will see you and know you. Fill us up so we will know we are never alone. God who loves us just as we are, how can you love us exactly because of who we are? That question fills our heart this day. We feel unworthy, we feel unlovable, we feel that we are on the outside looking in. Yet your love and grace for us never changes. Thank you, Lord. You amaze us once again because you love everybody. We lift our prayer in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from Closing him is hidden Christ alive forever.
Jesus' brothers and sisters. Let us try to be like him. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit be with and stay with us all. Now in the life everlasting.